these slaves named Onesimus had stolen from Philemon and run away with his stuff. Now in God's sovereign plan, the runaway slave Onesimus made his way to the capital of the empire, Rome. And somehow, we don't know how, we'd love to know how, somehow he met a man named Paul who was a prisoner. How he got into the prison, whether he was a prisoner for some time himself, we don't know, but he met Paul and he was converted. And it just happened that this man Paul who he met was the same preacher through whom his old master Philemon had been converted. But Onesimus is converted and now Paul is sending Onesimus back to Colossae, back to Philemon's house because Paul recognises that, that Onesimus is under the authority of another person. He doesn't have the right to hold on to Onesimus as helpful as he is. And so this is a letter trying to restore that broken relationship. It's soaked with love, soaked with practical advice on how to fix damaged relationships. Uh, and this time what we're going to see is four more key lessons from this letter. And, and the first one is this. God cares about the least of people. See, uh, Onesimus had made some bad decisions. And I mean really bad decisions. For whatever reason it was, he decided he no longer wanted to live in Philemon's house. He couldn't bear to be there, so he stole and he ran away. Now that put him in a perilous position. Because if a runaway slave was caught, at best... He'd be branded and sent back. And usually then the master would take the opportunity to teach the rest of his slaves that this is something you don't do in my house. Normally that would involve working him, literally working him to death. You would double, triple, quadruple his workload until eventually he just dropped from exhaustion. If the master decided that the slave just wasn't even worth the effort of doing that, couldn't be bothered to go to the trouble of teaching a lesson for him, he could be thrown to the animals in the arena. And so as soon as Onesimus stop, steps off Philemon's property, with Philemon's property, his life is, is worthless. In society's eyes, he's a dead man walking. And yet in God's eyes, this man Onesimus is, is very different. He thinks very differently about Onesimus. And he's got a plan for Onesimus. Good. And so he enables Onesimus to get to Rome. And in Rome he meets the same man whose preaching had led to the conversion of his old master. Uh, you, you, we find it funny, don't we, when we run into somebody in New Zealand or we run into somebody in Gore who happens to know somebody else that we know and we're like, oh, that's a, that's a nice coincidence. You imagine you've, you've fled from your home country to the capital of another country into Rome, hugely popular city, and you happen to run into somebody who intimately knows the old master that you've run away from. And not only that, but he gets to know Paul and Paul shares the gospel with him. And then he becomes a Christian and God works in Onesimus' heart. And so God has arranged all of this to do a work in Onesimus' life and the Holy Spirit opens his eyes and Onesimus is converted. God gives him a, a new heart and a new purpose. He wants to live for Jesus now. And so he gives his time to serve Paul. Uh, and then he's given a new mind because before all he had to, to think was, I've got to escape. I've got to get out of here. And now he thinks I've got to go back. God cared so much about Onesimus. Took him safely across the, the world, put him right in the path of Paul, drew him into the arms of Jesus, and, and then into new desire to do what's right. And so God takes a runaway slave that nobody thought anything of and changed his life. Now, that being the case, Onesimus should change our attitudes towards ourselves because no matter what you've heard what you've been told what you've believed from others or what lies you've told yourself that you've also believed about your own worthlessness or unlovability God said
kaya ba ang natural? You imagine I've got a 1990s Toyota Celica. Now that's nothing special. <laughs> and it's a bit rough around the edges. It's kind of the, you know, you can't afford it. I, I'm going to offend somebody who's got a Toyota. So somebody's going to have a 90s Celica in the garage at home. A Celica! You know, you can't afford a real sports car. So you get a Celica. This was the car that I wanted to grow as a teenager. Like, this was the, the, the dream vehicle. You know, everybody else, Porsche, Ferrari, give me a Celica. That's the way to go. So anyway, it's a bit rough. And it's not that flash, but it's precious to me. It means something to me. And so I do what I can to keep it clean and I polish it and I make it shine. And then you ask if you can borrow it for a month. And I begrudgingly say, oh, OK, but look after it. Two weeks later, I overhear you talking to somebody and you're saying, what a rust bucket this thing is. It handles like a, a shopping trolley. I'm embarrassed to be seen around town driving this thing. And I'm just, I overhear this, and I pretend I, pretend I haven't heard anything. Then, then next week, I see you pull up at the warehouse, and you kind of kick the door open, and it smacks into a wall, and three half-eaten KFC chicken legs drop out. And, and, and I'm looking at this, it kind of spills out into the car park. I'm not happy. Because you know I love that car. Whatever others might say about it, whatever anybody else might think, you know it's valuable to me. And so you speaking badly of it, you treating it badly, you're making an enemy out of the one who loves it. God loves the least of people. And so you saying, or me saying, that person, you know, they're nothing. It's belittling a soul that God cares deeply about. If you talk about a Christian like that, you're making little of one that Jesus has died for. You're saying that Jesus, who's the Lord of that person, wasted his time saving them. You're talking badly and treating badly a child of God. You do that. You make an enemy of their father. Don't call unclean what God has called clean. God cares deeply about his weakest, poorest kids. And maybe you're here for the first time this evening. Maybe God has brought you here by some strange set of circumstances, just as he brought Onesimus to Rome and, and met Paul. Or maybe you've stumbled across the video and you're watching online and you've been meaning to switch it off, but somehow you're, you're still watching at this point. And you, you don't know why you are. God knows. And God loves you. You're worth so much to him. He's brought you here because he wants you to hear about his son. He went to the cross for you. Died to rescue you from hell and make you right with God. How do you respond to that? Such great love. Fixed on you. Won't you love him too? The second great lesson that we learn from this letter is that God loves what is right more than what can be justified. Hear that again. God loves what is right more than what can be justified. Paul loved Onesimus. Not only was he his son in the faith, in that he'd been converted through his preaching, but he was really useful to Paul. He hadn't just come along to a meeting and been converted and never seen again, but he devoted his life now to helping Paul. And so there's a huge part of the apostle that doesn't want to send Onesimus back, doesn't want to let him go to Colossae. Look at verse 12. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. He said, it's going to kill me to send Onesimus back. Right, verse 13, I'd have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me. You know, I'd, I'd love to keep Onesimus here. It's incredible to think about the transformation. This is a runaway thieving slave uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the converted 
Pharisee of Pharisees and, and, and Paul saying I love this guy and I, I don't want to let him go and so God has transformed Onesimus who loves Paul and God has transformed Paul who loves Onesimus and it would have been so easy for him to, to say I'm holding on to him I'm keeping him here there's so many great reasons that Paul could have used to keep on to him I mean he was useful an apostle needs a helper doesn't he I mean Paul's in prison he needs someone to take his letters out and deliver them and, and to meet with people and and to invite them perhaps to the prison just maybe like Onesimus was to come and hear from Paul about how Jesus changed his life. There's so many arguments that that Paul could have marshaled and and given to Philemon and said, look, you know, I want to keep him here because he can serve me for you. Or he could have said to him, you know, it's better, surely, Philemon, you'll agree, better that Onesimus is a missionary here with me in Rome than cleaning your toilet in Colossae. For a man as as brilliant as Paul, it would have been a breeze to construct a a reason, theological, pragmatic argument as to why Onesimus should stay in Rome. Instead, we get 18 brilliant arguments all through this letter pleading for Onesimus to return to Colossae and be welcomed back. See, Paul could have very easily justified keeping Onesimus, but it wouldn't have been right because no matter what Paul wanted it's trumped by God's law that's how the apostle behaves whatever he wants is brought under and into submission to God's law Onesimus is obligated to someone else I once had a Christian friend I've told you about him before his language was awful and I'd I'd talk to him and say you know why do you swear like that and he said well if we don't speak like the world How are we ever going to reach the world? You can't think like that. It's absolutely bogus thinking. Because God is the one who determines how we live. And God is the one who determines how we engage the world. And we can find our justifications. We can find our arguments for how we might sin. But it's all trumped by the fact that God says plainly, don't do it. That's that's the end of the, the line there. There's no wiggle room on that. And what's more, if we're saying, well, I need to sin a little bit in order to reach the world. And so we're claiming that we've got these great motivations. Well, think about it. Who cares more about the salvation of the world? You or the God who sent his son to die on the cross to rescue it? God desires nobody should perish. He says that. And so you can be sure that his methods for ensuring that happens are the best ones. If he says to win the world, you've got to be different from the world, not just like the world, you can be sure his way is best. And you can also be certain that any alternative, even those that come with the best intentions, are offensive to God because they're showing unbelief in his wisdom and in his methods. Grasp this because it's key. Our success as God's people and our success as Wyndham Evangelical Church will not be measured by how many people come through the doors. It won't be measured even by how many people profess faith here. The success of our church won't be measured by the the community's opinion of us. Our success will be based on one thing. Have we been faithful to God's word? Have we done what he commands? Have we done it in his way? Have we resolutely continued to sow gospel seed even when it seems like nothing will grow and nobody will respond? Do we keep doing it? Because because it's how God's commanded us to act and behave. And have we clung faithfully to God's mission and faithfully to God's method even when everyone else seems to be giving up on these things? See, a church is not necessarily one, or a great church is not necessarily one with great numbers, but with great hearts determined to follow Jesus and obey his will. We live as God's people to do what is right and to follow his word. And that's why this has primacy in our meetings it's why we build our services around god's word it's why hayden began this evening with a theme and with a verse from scripture to to bring our hearts and minds into worship so that we're motivated by the truth and not by music though we consider it valuable not by atmosphere 
Not by anything else, but by the word. Because the truth is what guides us. And this is what we must do. And this is what trumps whatever what we might want. In the same way as Paul wants to keep on Onesimus. But it's not right. Because he knows God loves what is right much more than what can be justified. Lesson number three. And this is the, the heart of this evening and, and this big theme, you know, God using weak things to do great things. The third lesson we see here is that God uses small things to slay giants. And we need to be reminded of this more than ever because there are many giants frightening Christians animosity towards things like like bible in schools homosexual lobby and how loud and, and proud that is pro-abortion movement christians tremble at these things the book of philemon is paul's shortest letter in the bible shortest one doesn't have the theological scope of romans doesn't have the historical breadth of, of hebrews it's a little letter about a personal issue that could so easily have been forgotten. And yet God preserved it. And it's part of our Bibles. And just like every other of the 65 books, it is here for a reason. I had a friend in university called Matt. And one day I ran into him and he said, look at this. And he showed me his thumb. And Matt had been doing the monthly dishwash. And as a student, those dishes have been left out for a long time. And you know what spaghetti's like when it's been left for a long time? You could build houses out of that stuff, right? It's like cement. If you leave spaghetti cooked onto a pot, that is it's like glue. It is not going anywhere. So Matt's washing up a pot. And he got his thumb caught on a piece of spaghetti that was stuck on the side. And the spaghetti went up underneath his fingernail and snapped off. And so he just had a little bit, five mils of spaghetti and his fingernail. I didn't see Matt for a little while after that. When I ran into him again, it turned out he'd been in hospital for a month. Because that little piece of spaghetti had caused an infection that nearly killed him. Genuinely nearly killed him. This tiny, innocuous letter. Paul writing to his friend in Colossae about a broken relationship. The smallest letter in the Bible that Paul wrote killed a giant. See, this letter resulted in the end of slavery in the Roman Empire. We sing a carol at Christmas time that has these words. Talking about Jesus. Surely he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains he shall break. For the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression will cease. Look at verse 16. Paul wrote to tell Philemon, that slave who ran away is coming back. But he's not coming back as a slave. He's coming back as a brother. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The slave is our brother. And as soon as you believe that, slavery is over. The death blow is struck and slavery can't last. Because I can't ask my brother to live like that. And I can't see my brother as less than human less valuable now some of us here have a deep desire to see the end of abortion but that won't come when politicians propose changes to laws it will come 
When people see unborn babies as God does. When we see that the fetus is brother. And that child with Down syndrome is brother. And the child conceived through rape or through incest is not a clump of cells. It's not a lesser form of humanity. But brother. Because when you believe that, you can't kill your brother. See, the, the day God opens a person's eyes to see unborn babies like that, it's the day abortion ends for them. And so that's what we pray. Not that people's minds will be conquered with clever arguments, but their hearts will be changed and eyes opened to the truth. That God would take his word, change things, take something weak and small, and transform our world again, transform hearts again. The fourth and final lesson that we see from this letter is this. God saves relationships through intercession. And so here's Philemon and, and here's Onesimus and Paul's writing this letter to bring these two back together. So you imagine two bits of whatever you want to imagine being glued together and the glue in between is the gospel of love. That's, what going, that's what's going to unite them. But, but while that gelling's happening, you need a couple of hands or you need a vice to hold those two things together. It's Paul's hands then that God is going to use to bring Onesimus and bring um, Philemon back together and gel them in there with the gospel of love. It's his hands there. And so God is going to use Paul as a kind of mediator, an intercessor. He's a, a middleman to help fix that broken relationship. And so in that and through this letter, we get a crystal clear picture of what the Lord Jesus has done for us in reuniting us with God. If you want to understand how a person becomes a Christian, the word to remember is intercession. And you, you follow this through what happened with Onesimus. Onesimus had sinned. Onesimus had sinned against Philemon. And you and I have sinned against God. We've broken his law, refused to accept his rule over our lives. We've stolen from him because he's our maker and we've run off with his property, his belongings. We're his creature. And yet we've said, I want to live my way. I'm going to call the shots. We've stolen his glory. Onesimus fled from Philemon and we've run away from God. We read that in scripture. We like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. We've gone our own way. We said, I'm doing it my way. I don't want a master over my life. Certainly not any other one than myself. Onesimus deserved punishment. And so do we. I mean, do you really think that we could spit in the face of God like that? Run away with God's stuff and, and get away with it? And then him having crucified his son in order to to restore that relationship, to look at it and say, no, that's nothing. That we would have spent a minute of our lives thinking that way, thinking nothing of the Lord Jesus, not having trusted him, not having repented of our sin. That if we spend a, a moment like that, it's, it's sticking our chin out, sticking our fingers up at what God has done for us. We're so resistant to that. We can't get away with it. God is a God of justice. And now Paul intercedes for Onesimus. See, though Onesimus doesn't deserve anything, and Paul owes him nothing, yet he stands between him and Philemon. And in this letter, it's like he puts his arms around both and he says, let's fix this relationship. And the Lord Jesus stands between us in our sin. And God in his holy, sin-hating purity. And he says, let's make this right. Paul pleads for Onesimus. The Lord Jesus does that for us. He did it in Gethsemane hours before his death. He prays. John 17, his high priestly prayer. He prays for all his people that we might be reconciled to God. Paul asks that the, the slave and the master become brothers. The Lord Jesus asks that the creature and the creator the judge and the criminal, the executioner and the condemned become father and son. 
Paul pays for Onesimus. Verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. What was owed to God because of our sin? Everything we are. Our very lives are forfeit. The wages of sin is death. On the cross, the Lord Jesus paid that debt with his life. On the cross, the Lord Jesus says to us all, that sin that's caused that division, that's ruined that relationship with God, that makes you rotten in his eyes, I'll take it. That, that sin of yours, I'll take it on myself. And he says to the Father, all that wrath, all that anger and just fury against wickedness, I'll bear that. I'll take it and bear it in my body so that everything is, that's owing in this relationship is liquidated. In my sacrifice. Paul prevails for Onesimus. He's confident, verse 21, that Philemon's going to receive Onesimus. Oh, we, we'd love to find out what actually happened at the end of this story. We can believe what church history tells us, that it was reconciled and Onesimus became a great leader in the, the early church. But we can't sit, sit with confidence on that like we can on God's word. But what we can be absolutely confident, what we can be infinitely confident about is that the Lord Jesus prevailed in his intercession between us and God. And we know that because the Father raised him from the dead. It's a great sign to our world that there is now a person who can make us right with God. Who can deal with our sin and turn away God's wrath so that rebels become sons. In light of that, what do you need to do? Nothing. <laughs> you think Jesus did all that great intercessory work and didn't finish it? Left the job incomplete? Left a little bit for you to do? No chance. What did he say from the cross? It is finished. It's done. The work is done. All that's left to you is to turn from how you've been living to repent and believe it turn from your sin rely wholeheartedly on the Lord Jesus he restores ruined relationships let's pray mighty God we thank you for your word and we thank you that just as you are mighty so your word is mighty and we pray that by your Holy Spirit it would have its effectual work in our hearts tonight that the things that we've heard, they wouldn't leave us. We wouldn't forget them. They wouldn't be lost as we get caught up with all the busyness and the plans of the week. But, but we pray for your glory and for our, our desperate need to grow and, and our desperate desire to be useful to you and our hunger not to waste our lives. We pray that You'd help us to put into practice what we've heard. If nothing else, don't let us leave this place without truly having trusted in the Lord Jesus, his intercessory work. We thank you, precious Saviour, that you've done that for us, that you've taken all of our rotten sin on yourself and borne in your body all of the wrath, <coughs> all of the anger and, and justice that was coming our way. So there's not a drop of it left, not a, not a little bit of God's anger for us to absorb, for you've taken it all. You've paid it all. Oh, we just rejoice that that's true. We thank you that you're there even now in the heavenlies interceding for us as our great high priest. Uh, we, we ask that you'd, you'd help us to walk closely with you and keep our eyes firmly fixed on you. We pray it in your precious name. Amen.